Good morning, everyone. We are here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and this is the interview you needed that you didn't know you needed. <laughs> and this is a first time where we have a Buddhist monk talking to a tennis pro owner of RCW Athletic Club, a tennis club here in Pennsylvania. And I just wanted to get you to meet George Zink, uh, his club, to see the projects that he's doing here, uh, the tennis players and the athletes that we have here, some of the challenges that comes up, and then also how do we support these athletes and just a whole lot of conversation. But yes, with that, Hello, George. Hi. Welcome. Venerable Nana uh, here. Where are we? <laughs> what is this and what is RCW? Let's start there. Okay, great. So uh, we are a six indoor, eight outdoor tennis facility. Yeah. Uh, we added two uh, padel courts and uh, we are very involved in pickleball now. Mm. So it's pretty exciting. Um, we bought the club in July of 2020. It just happened that I grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And uh, I tried to, this was my childhood tennis club. Mm. Um, I took my first tennis lesson here when I was six years old. Wow. So, and then in 2012, I tried to buy the club and w couldn't buy it. So my family and I moved to Florida to pursue my children's uh, tennis career. And so we were in Florida until 2020, of July of 2020, and I got a chance to buy the club. And now here we are. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. So with that, how did we get here? Now you're sitting with a Buddhist monk. Yes. <laughs> how did we meet? How did mentor uh, meditation enter into this conversation? Uh, that's a great question. So about 10 years ago, um, I was in Sarasota. And on Tuesday nights, uh, I went to a, a Buddhist temple. And I would just start listening to talks. I was meditating uh, sporadically. Um, but I would, I went to every Tuesday and I started realizing the teachings and they just really, um, resonated with me. Fast forward, um, until I started meditating and that was the practice that started every day. And so for se seven years now, I've practiced every day. Fast forward to 2020 when we bought the club, um, I found your YouTube channel. Uh. <laughs> And I um, just fell in love with it. And, and from the Buddhist temple, and the, the closest one from here is a little far away. So I started using your teachings. Um, and I just loved them. And then I decided to reach out to you. And I sent you, you an email and just said, look, what we are doing here at RCW, we're teaching everybody, all the children. We have over 1,500 children here at RCW now. Wow and teaching everybody meditation. We start with one minute for the young ones and then it goes to two or three to five. And we're just so excited. So we are really just into it. And then um, we had our first event two years ago uh, and we invited the community of Lancaster County. And I think we had over 220 people and it was just so exciting. Wow. And then for your own meditation practice, how did you see the benefit of it? And then from seeing the benefit of it, how did you integrate it where it's a daily meditation practice? Because so many people, they see the benefits, mm -hmm. but to have a daily practice, and you said you've been doing it for a long time, how did you spark that? Yeah, the great question. Uh, I think the biggest thing that I've realized in the last couple of weeks is that when I started going to the Buddhist temple and had a sense of community mm. and had a practice and just learned some of the wisdom, I realized that I needed some of that to continue my meditation, to make it a daily practice. And then what I kind of call my ROI, what is my return of investment? I started to see really pretty quickly, I started to see space between my emotions and my reactions. Mm, wow. And so that was the biggest thing. So it could be with my children, it could be with my wife, it could be with a friend, it could be with somebody on the road. And I just realized that the emotion would come up and I wouldn't react quite as fast. And when I started to realize that there was space in between my emotions 
and my reactions, I was like, oh. wow. and it was like, I, and it felt to me so deep in my soul that meditation is the answer. I grew up in a sort of a really chaotic family and always dealt with some anxiety and, and just didn't know what to do with it. Um, I played t very high competitive tennis growing up and with that comes some anxiety. And I just realized that how do I calm it down? I never wanted myself, I, nothing against medicine for people, nothing, but for myself, I never necessarily wanted to take medicine because I, was, I wanted to try to see if I could do it on my own first. Um, and, and then I just dove into meditation. But I think the sense of community in Florida really helped me. And then honestly, finding your YouTube channel was a blessing. Wow. And then when it comes to meditation, is there really a space for it in tennis? Because you work with the people who are just playing for fun yes. or young kids all the way up to the pros. Is there a space for it and is it needed now? A really good question. In my opinion, it's more needed now than ever. Mm. Um, I think with even for pro tennis that play in front of thousands and thousands of people creates anxiety. But I think the biggest thing for a tennis player or any sport is that we're always after a result. Mm. And I think the biggest thing is to trying to feel how do we get into the present? I think people talk about all the time about, oh, being in the present or being in the moment. But there's no, in my opinion, there's no way to be in the present and the moment if you don't practice being in the present in the moment. So when you're out on the tennis court, and I'll give you an example, you're up 4-1 in the first set and your opponent starts coming back. They start playing very well. The mind just wants to make up stories. It wants to get away from you. And it wants, what we talk about the inner critic, it just wants to go. And I think being able to slow down, take some space, close your eyes when you're walking towards the back curtain and really figuring out that that you're getting into the now and not looking ahead or making up stories. And that's what I found uh, with my ch own children. My son is right now, he's getting ready to play professional tennis and he meditates every day. And it's incredible how much it has, has helped him. So I really believe that it is a sort of an answer um, to playing better tennis. And even for the club level of the people here at the club that are just local players, I've seen um, it really work for them too. Uh -huh. And then how have you been able to implement meditation? You said you started with the young kids. Yeah. How did that come about? And then also, how do you get started? You just mm. have them close their eyes, mm. is someone guiding them. Yes. How, how did that come up? So I, I think for me, because I didn't have a lot of experience teaching it, um, but I also realized what it did in my life. And when I bought the club, I felt like a sense of duty that, hey, I'm, I, I took my first lesson here. And how can we impact the community the most? So I love tennis. And then I love meditation. So I wanted to just help the children. And we do it with the adults too, but I wanted to help the children. So what we started doing with the kids all of our programs before it starts we have all the children just sit in a circle or sit down on the tennis court and then we play a one minute to five minute depending on the age a guided meditation for them what's really cool is now we are getting just tons of comments from parents saying how much their child has changed and they said they love to give it to the you know for tennis and the club but they said meditation that is is what's really changed them. Wow. So really yeah. cool. And you've been doing this for over a year now, uh, having them practice meditation before their lessons. What have you noticed as some of the benefits or results? Yes. So the biggest thing that we've noticed internally is a sense of respect, yeah. um, a sense of calmness. Um, when you come into a tennis facility with you know, you could be on a court with anywhere from six to 10 or 12 kids at a time, and that can be chaotic. And I think there's this sense of calmness now. And there's this, they, they look forward to sitting down and getting a meditate and meditating. And once they come out of the meditation, there's just a sense of organization that they don't know. On the parent side, 
um, that what we don't see here at the club, but the parents are giving us feedback at home is just saying, you know, Johnny is making his bed every single morning now, and he never did that. Um, Johnny is, was at the dinner table and started asking me questions about me and wow. wasn't just huge, huge, huge. And, and we're hearing this, honestly, we're hearing this on a daily basis and just all the benefits. And, it, you know, the same thing that you asked me, what made my meditation keep going? This is what has motivated our whole team of how much we want meditation to, to just keep teaching it because we are seeing the results pretty quickly. Yeah, and we got a chance to meet with your team. They're so kind. Wow. What was that like for you to see that experience mm. where myself, the Venerable Michael, talking to your team, we practiced meditation together? Mm. It's interesting. Um, what I was blown away by was that everybody was so receptive. Mm. And what I, what I also, after we meditated at the beginning of the team meeting, I also sensed a sense of calm, um, caring for each other. I think people were sharing stories that I don't think they would normally share. And it just made me as the leader of the company just feel amazing. Awesome. And you have a philosophy for RCW. What is that? So one of our, we have a, a, our culture, we have five different pieces of the culture, but part of our culture, that, which is our most precious one, is super kind, super nice. Um, we have healthy conflict. But to help, uh, we want to come into work and be super kind, super nice to each person that we, and that includes each other, which it starts, and then out to the community. And we, you know, for me, I think I told you this the other day, which is interesting. My meditation piece has really helped me with that. And I think that's what we're also seeing with the kids mm -hmm. is just being a little nicer um, because of that space in between our thoughts and our emotions. Right. And, and some people would say like, okay, George, I get it. Be kind, be nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's put meditation. I'm here for tennis. Mm -hmm. What is, why is that so important? Why are these things like meditation or kindness and compassion, be nice? How does that relate to anything? Yeah, um, during uh, our talk the other night, one of the things that I said to the, the, the people that came, that I said that no one ever got in an argument or had road rage, and right after that, they felt wonderful. Because <laughs> every time it happened in my life, it never felt wonderful. Mm. And what I'm seeing is that the philosophy and the culture of being super kind, super nice, I get it all the time that somebody comes home and says, hey, my, my husband has noticed that I'm just a nicer person. And George, thank you for creating that culture. And I think that all stems from you know, my meditation practice that, you know, early in my life that I could get angry and I could get upset pretty quickly. And now I think everyone also sees that I'm not getting upset or I'm being super kind, super nice. And I just think that it goes from one person to the next, which is just incredible. Mm -hmm. And I can just sense everyone says here at RCW that how much they love working here because they love being around somebody that is super kind, super nice. Because I don't think any, any of us really want to be around mean people. Right. I choose that one. <laughs> exactly. 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 Wow. Yeah. That's so wonderful. And then for the youth who are um, growing up now and they're playing tennis, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing with them? Mm. Is it comparison? Is it jealousy? Is it anxiety? What are some of the major ones? Yeah, so athletes. So we have uh, over 1,100 members here at RCW, and I'm here every day. So I'll speak about just our members uh, mostly, but then I'm also out in the tennis community with you know my children playing at their tournaments. But I really see a, a major sense of anxiety. I mean, I think that's the biggest one. Um, obviously, there's uh, depression, uh, but. The anxiety one really seems to be high with the tennis world. Uh, uh, and an adult or, it will come up to me and just say, you know, how stressed out they are with everyday life. And I see that. And, and I um, always mention meditation first. And I say, you know, I just ask them, have you, have you meditated? And, and a lot of them are starting to come back to me and starting to say, ah, so I think the anxiety piece is the one that I see on a daily basis that I, 
really think that meditation can just be a tool in your pocket for. But I, I, I do see a lot of it here. Yeah, and anxiety during the game or before the game, after the game. You know, it's funny that you that's a great question that you asked that because I, I think it happens at the I think it actually happens before they walk on the court wow. and then the court just magnifies it. Mm. And I think that's what that's what I'm seeing. And and all of a sudden you'll see somebody out there and then I'll talk to them and they say, Oh, before I even got out on the court, I was driving here and I just had so much anxiety. And it, and I said, About the match? No, no, just about life. And so I think I, we're seeing a lot of that. And, and then walk me through, um, then for you, someone is experiencing anxiety. How do I start to change this? Mm. Is it implementing a meditation practice daily? It's doing it before my matches. Visual, like what specifically can they start to do? Yeah, I, I would love to give um, my son uh, Tyler as an example mm. because I think that he's really living it on a daily basis um, because he plays, you know, he's getting ready to play professional um, tennis. He's a senior in college. And I think what that he struggled creating a daily meditation practice, but the anxiety would come up and it would come back up and come back up. And we uh, just kept talking about well, could we maybe sit on the phone and meditate? Could we, could, can I help you in any way? And once he started doing it daily, he started noticing almost right away that the anxiety would subside. Wow. And so we, we just talk about that on a daily basis. And, and I think it is, I, I personally think it is hard for, for um, people to get into the practice of doing it day to day. Mm. But I always say to them, compared to what i mean is that better than having the anxiety day to day and i really believe that it's a major tool to uh to help anxiety mm. yeah and then what about building confidence do you have any advice for young athletes or students or people of in life in general how do you build that mm. that's a great question I have a couple things as being a tennis coach that I think um, confidence is the easiest thing to lose and the hardest thing to obtain. And then I also say that routine builds confidence. Mm. A healthy routine. That's the one thing that I say the most. Ru healthy routine. What does that mean? That means that getting up every day and saying, I am going to spend one minute meditating. I'm, I'm going to spend two minutes meditating. And I think that routine, uh, waking up and understanding that I want a routine. The other thing that I think is organizing your life. And you, you sort of, I learned that from you, uh, is making sure that your room is clean, making sure that your house, your, your car is clean, making sure that you, you make your bed. I think all of these little things build confidence. And, and then the other thing that I say is lear learning what the mind is thinking. That's the one thing that helped me the most. What is my mind thinking? So it, driving here today, was it thinking just an inner critic sort of kind of beating me up the whole drive here or were did i was able to catch it and start thinking positive i think those little incremental changes of catching your brain going to the negative side and the only way again the only way that i think that that happens is by meditating mm, so you just need to develop that awareness first yes catch yes. it catch it yeah i think when you catch it um, it's just so beautiful. And, you know, everybody says to me, when will I stop getting negative thoughts? In my opinion, maybe never. But if you catch it early and then you can change the script, I think that helps so much. Mm. And then how do you coach these students to deal with comparison? I can imagine as a young person or even uh, the professional athletes where... He's doing better than me, George. Mm. Look yes. at look at his skills. Look at his ability. What? How, how do we? One of the things that we teach here at RCW is to sort of one thing is to go that comes to mind right away is to go on social media breaks. I think sometimes with the kids with TikTok and Snapchat and all of these platforms, it's really easy to get into the comparison thing. And then also the same thing is is catching yourself when you comparing him. Are you comparing, what are you comparing it for? 
are you comparing it because you know in Tyler's case or Lindsay's case or Kate's case, my my kids is it is it easy to oh that person's ranked higher than I am that person's doing better, but just learning to understand is that I want to be happy for that person instead of jealous of that person. Mm. I love to see them succeed because someday I, I'm going to be there. And I think really understand the biggest thing for me is catching yourself. And, and, and when you start to compare, because in my, it's the same thing with an argument or getting mad. We never feel good mm. after comparing ourselves. So is really, I think is just trying to catch yourself early on instead of, of letting it go and for three days comparing myself to someone and then making myself feel bad. Right. Awesome. And then regarding the inner critic, I can imagine that's a big one mm. in the in the tennis space. Uh, any advice, tips on? Yeah, I think the inner critic, um, that's one of the biggest things that I've seen a huge um, impact in my life. It, and it's interesting talking to people, they come up to us each and every day and I'm in, I'm usually in the lobby or in my office right inside the door. So I see everybody come in and that that's the first thing they say to me. And I think that's a, that's a, you know, the inner critic is there in their eyes all the time. And they ask me, how can I silence the inner critic? How can I make it go away? And why is it there? And I always say to them, you know, I'm not hundred percent sure why it's there, but I know it's in all of us the biggest thing that we have to do is again, it comes back. I don't want me to repeat myself, but it comes back to just recognizing it and understanding that it doesn't have power over us. So we're talking about that all the time to we're st And what I love is that to a 12 year old that went to a tennis tournament and said, you know, I was up in the match and then I was just so worried that I was going to lose the match. I was just so afraid that, m you know, my parents were going to be upset with me. Uh, and, you know, they wouldn't be happy with me. And we're talking to a 12 or 14 year old and it, it sort of makes my, you know, I, I don't love it. You know, it's like, I feel bad and I'm, I, how can I help? And, and I just keep coming back and I say, just know that those thoughts aren't real. Those thoughts are just thoughts and we don't have to listen to them. Um, and then I automatically want to go into the meditation piece because I, I personally think that it is a, just a wonderful tool. I'm sure it's not the only tool, but it's the tool that helped me the most. Yeah. And when we talk about healthy athletes, mm -hmm. what does that consist of now, in your opinion, uh, training so many uh, people yeah. here in Pennsylvania? Uh, I think it's my, taking care of your mind, body, and spirit. I really do. I think that tennis players to think of a healthy tennis player think that I just have to get better at tennis. Mm. No, you have to get better with your mind. You have to get better. You have to treat your body well, and you have to treat your spirit well. You have to be kind to yourself. And I say this to my team, as we want to be super kind, super nice to each other, we definitely have to be super kind and super nice to ourselves. Mm. And I think that's a big deal. And if we can start to be super kind, super nice, and have some grace with ourselves, I think that to me is how we can be a healthy athlete. And I, I've just seen it in my own children um, because they, they have major struggles too. And I just see them using these tools to be a little more gracious with myself. Oh, that, that makes me feel healthier. And then when we see it, it, you can see them start to do well on the tennis court and in, and in life, which I love. Yeah. And you always mention that Tennis teaches people so much about life. Mm -hmm. How so? Mm. What does that mean? So I wrote a book called The Process, and, and basically it talks about just all the life lessons that I learned from the tennis court. I use this one word, that you, being resourceful, right? Figuring things out. Um, again, having an opponent 78 feet across the net. When I grew up, I kind of felt like I needed to be mad at that person. Well, I had to be mad at that person to beat them. No, you don't need to be mad at that person. You just need to take care of your side. So I think now I teach, you can be kind out on the tennis court and be a great competitor. Wow. I, I think it teaches you organization. I think it teaches you managing time. I think it teaches you so much about what life is like out there. Um, if you're, for example, uh, I everybody that, uh, 
it has a tennis bag. What does your tennis bag look like? Pull out the things in your tennis bag. Um, do you know where your grips are? Do you know where your shoelace, extra shoelaces are? Do you have a jump rope in your bag? All, organization of your tennis bag all of a sudden makes you a better tennis player. So I think all of these things, organization for my tennis bag, organization in my room. So I think there's so much um, that we teach early on here at RCW with a five-year-old. We teach them how to shake hands and look somebody in the eyes. Because I noticed that, I've noticed that the kids here, they don't look you in the eye anymore. They're almost a little scared. And so we teach to look somebody in the eye and to really feel their spirit as you're talking to them and understand where they're coming from. Not just want to get your words out, but you're looking at them in their eyes and seeing what they have to say. So that's a, that's a big one for us is just, and, and we, and you have to shake hands at the end of a tennis match every single time. And when Tyler was little, uh, he would sort of look down or look away uh-huh. when he, when he, when he lost the match. Uh-huh. Um, but now when you, you see him finish a tennis match, even when he loses, he'll look the, per- he'll look his opponent in the eye with respect and basically say, great job today. You know, you were a little bit better than me today. Um, and that's okay. Wow. Fantastic. And then when it comes to being a, a great athlete, this feels so counterintuitive because you were always taught of, you need to be a beast. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You need to be number one. You need to be aggressive. You need, isn't this counterintuitive where, okay, let me be soft. Yeah. Let me be kind. Yeah. Let me sit down with my eyes closed. Like, are you sure that's going to help someone? Really good question too. Um, you know, it's not done all the time. Um, but I'll give in a good example of how it's done or when it's done. And I think the world sort of knows this person and he's a wonderful role model is Roger Federer. Roger Federer was the first person that actually, um, cultivated a relationship with his biggest rival, which is Rafael Nadal. Mm. And they became just really close friends. And I think that he showed the fact that you can be nice and kind and still have an inner drive. Sometimes people will come up to me and they'll say, George, you know, one of the things I'm afraid if I meditate the most is that my inner drive will go away. Right. And I say, no, it will cultivate your inner drive and you'll be able to channel your inner drive. It does. Like for me, I I have probably the biggest inner drive of anyone. My children tell me that anyway, of anybody I know. But what I've learned is that that felt like a race car. If a race car can go 200 miles an hour and that's the top. It feels like, oh, now it's going 260 miles an hour and it's out of control. An out of control race car will wreck. Mm. And I think the same thing with myself. I just have to be in control. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And then do you have any uh, advice for uh, coaches or trainers out there regarding meditation? Maybe they do want to incorporate some mindset training uh, meditation grounding into their practice a- any anything for coaches yeah and it's interesting that i'm getting phone calls now uh, a lot from um other tennis clubs around the country and hearing what we're doing and the first thing that i say is that it has to come from the coaches first um that's something that we have implemented not every one of our coaches obviously meditated before we started doing this what I've realized is that our practice that we put on court, the coaches are meditating during that time. Mm-hmm. And now they're starting to see the benefits of it. They were obviously doing it because, you know, it was part of our system. But now the coaches are starting to do it. And I think that the coaches are starting to become better leaders. But again, I think the hardest thing for people to do is to make it a daily practice. Mm. And I really believe that once they do, they'll see the biggest benefits. And I'm seeing it with not every one of our coaches meditate every single day for sure, but I'm starting to see them doing a little more and a little more. And I, and the ones that are do it, I can just see they become better leaders and, and, and better coaches and, and able to see again, the difference between the emotion and the reaction. Because when you're out on a court as a coach with a a student, it's easy to get triggered. You know, you're working with somebody like we have coaches here that are working with somebody every single day. And it's almost like a parent child relationship and they see them every day, every day, every day, and they can be triggered. Or if they had a frustrated day and 
the child's not playing well or that day, it's 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 hard to be really, ah, oh, no worries, no problem, it's okay. You know, sometimes they'll get mad. You know, I've seen it all over the country. They'll, they'll, a coach will get mad at a student yeah. where you can see our coaches sort of, again, having some of that time in between the reaction and the emotion. So I think that's really... I really believe it's almost more important for the coaches because the kids are looking to see what emotions and 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 reactions the coaches have. So they're sort of the leaders. They're the models. Exactly. For that. Exactly. And then, what is your advice for the athletes coming up of of all ages as a coach, as a father, <laughs> as a parent to your kid who is becoming pro any Thing for these young athletes coming up. Yes, I mean again, I, I I think is to understand that it is a chaotic world. I don't think that we can get away from that. And I, if, if I could have a magic wand, I would love to make it non chaotic tomorrow or non crazy, but we can't. The biggest thing is how to deal with it. And I think that if we give these students and the ability to ha have a tool in their back pocket that they can handle the day-to-day -day stuff. And they don't have to get caught up in the craziness all the time. And I think if we can just share that with them on a daily basis and we can be role models of what that's like, I think to me that's, that's part of the answer is that you don't have to get caught up in it and you don't have to compare yourself. And just understand that if you if you have a meditation practice, this, this can help. And honestly, um, you and uh, Venerable Michael have just really helped us at RCW so much. Uh, I, I can't thank you guys enough because the impact that you have had on our community is absolutely, absolutely amazing. Oh, thank you so much. And just this past week and a few days ago, we did our second time second year event with the indoor candlelight meditation last year we had a full house this year we had a great turnout as well we did a panel we did a guided meditation for you now bringing that kind of environment that opportunity into this space and then offering to the community what did that night mean for you mm. uh it meant a lot to me um, it, it made me realize that on a small scale, we can have impact. And I said goodbye last year and this year to everybody that left the building. And I could see people crying. I could see people out of sort of out of joy. I could see people smiling. Uh, I got emails the next day and texts the next day. I just think that these two events, slowly but surely, are just making a humongous impact on our community and I am proud to say that RCW is is part of that and and to share meditation with Lancaster County and to and 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 uh, to to bring meditation in I think is incredible and I'm, I'm super proud that our team at RCW was able to do that Awesome. Thank you so much, George. This is so beautiful. And for us, it's a pleasure to be here. We're so honored to work with you, your team, your players, everyone. Everyone here has been so beautiful and open. But for anyone wanting more information, please feel free to visit their website. Feel free. If you're a coach, feel free to contact George, anything regarding uh, meditation. But I guess we'll be doing uh, these events yearly. So please come out if you get a chance. But any last words for you? Uh, no, I just want to thank you so much for inter interviewing me. And I uh, just thank you for everything that you have done for us. Thank, thank you. you. We're so proud of you and your team. Thank, so you. thank you. And for everyone watching, as always, sending you my blessings and hope you are doing well. Until everyone.